So I want to start by thanking you for being here. It's my pleasure to be here again and tell you what we're doing at IBM Quantum. So our mission is very simple. We are focused on bringing useful quantum computing to the world. To me, we set out with three milestones. The first milestone happened last year where we really wanted to show that we can transition for what I'm calling quantum devices to quantum computers where we can start to run quantum circuits that are beyond brute force classical simulations. And we we're very proud of achieving this. In 2026, working with our partners, and maybe even this year, I am hoping us as a field can demonstrate clear, scientific, verifiable, and separate quantum advantage. And as I've talked about many times before, we have a path to building a fault tolerant quantum computer, and it is our goal to deliver that by 2029. So I want to start with some facts. The quality of a quantum processor is dependent on three things. How fast it can go, its quality, and its speed. For superconducting qubits, we have a metric that we measure called CLOPS, and we're proud of the fact that IBM is leading the way in execution speed for their quantum processors. If we compare this to other technologies, it can be as much as 400 to a couple of thousand times faster, and that in the end results in it being cheaper to run. Let's take speed as one. The other two variables are scale and quality. We have to make sure when we're building larger and larger quantum processes that at a scale of over, as I said, at 100 qubits, we are starting to push the error rates to uh, get down to the goal of getting down to 10 to the negative four. I put the dotted line there to show where I see the separation between what I'm calling quantum devices and quantum computers. You have to be at this point for you to have a machine that is actually a scientific tool. And I'm very proud of the fact that we've transitioned and evolved to quantum computers. I'll call out that Coera, uh, Google, and the Chinese Academy of Science is also in this regime. At this scale of quantum computers is where you can start using this as a scientific tool. But before I go there, I want to get a little bit of a history. In 2016, we put the first quantum computer on the cloud. Since then, we've actually deployed 60 quantum devices, and now we've deployed over 24 quantum computers. Every one of our data centers has quantum, what I call quantum computers, 100 qubit machines. We have a data center in Poughkeepsie with six of them, and we have a data center in Einigen, uh, Germany, where we have three of them. When you start thinking of systems, actually other metrics become equally important. We need to make sure the jobs run. We are extremely proud of the fact that for our systems, they have a job success rate of 99.4%. We also create a cloud platform. We've put so much work into calibrating, automating it, that across our fleet, our systems are 90%, 97% available, and we make sure that we keep 100% availability to one of our best quantum computers. So what I want to point out there is as you go from Devices to computers, you've got to start thinking of it through the system lens. We also have many on-site quantum computers around the world. These represent strategic partners that really want to investigate how to use these quantum computers in, uh, for applications as well as HPC integration. From Tokyo in Japan to recently announced um, the quantum computer that will be installed in Chicago, uh, and, um, and India, and soon to be turned on in Spain. 
So that's the quantum computers. From the quantum software, it is our goal to be open, to get quantum software that is performant and to make sure it's uh, integrated, useful, and easy to use. We are very proud of the fact that Qiskit has become the gold standard. 74% of the developers that are surveyed use Qiskit, and it has over 7,000 different projects dependent on it, showing that we're starting to build this community. In the last few years, we've invested in performance of it, and now Qiskit is about 71 times faster than the closest compiler and makes more efficient circuits of around 30%. But more important than compiling quantum circuits is making sure we start to work towards applications and algorithms. I'm very proud of the fact that many of our partners are committing to open source, showing how they can take their research, creating what we call Qiskit add-ons, making it easier and easier for many of our clients and partners to extend and go forward. Then, as we work with many of the startup partners, we've created this concept we call Qiskit functions, where we can integrate uh, our clients' IP, their algorithms, such that our, part, our clients and our partners can use them to go further. Take, for example, Eon using QControl's recent performance management tools, or Yonsei using Quinova's uh, chemistry package to make their research easier and easier. IBM Quantum has a network. Ever since we put the quantum computer on the cloud, we've continued to build a partnership of industry members, client partners, as well as research institutes. This is just a snapshot of a few of them, but you see that we continue to grow this with all of you. I'm not gonna go into the roadmap other than say we continue to check off everything we've done. I encourage you to watch forward for the rest of the year as we continue to hit 2025. So what I wanted to take this last 10 minutes uh, to talk about is what's exciting to me is now we have quantum computers I actually think we're entering a new era of algorithm discovery. What that means is we've got to think of ways at where we can actually run these quantum circuits on hardware. We can actually make them accurate, get reliable results, and then we can start to think of interesting problems that we want to start mapping to quantum circuits because we want to get useful quantum computing to the world as quick as possible. I like to frame it in terms of what I'm calling computational areas or algorithm horizontals. Rather than focusing just on the end use case, I want to understand, can I actually come up with examples in Hamiltonian simulation? Can we come up in examples of optimization? Can we come up in examples of machine learning? And can we come up in examples with differential equations? If we can work together as a community to create these horizontals and explore what is possible, we'll set ourselves up for many different uh, use cases. So let's jump into a few of them. Hamiltonian simulation. The idea here is you want to use a quantum computer to simulate another quantum physics property. So you want to either use it to explore chemistry or materials. With our partners at Recon, what they've done is actually taken a quantum computer and used it to in, uh, as an input into a classical algorithm to look at a very large, uh, large molecule, in this case, ion, an ion sulfur cluster, and they're able to get accuracies and results that are getting beyond the easily efficiently simulated classical methods, still not beating DMRG, the gold stand, one of the gold standards, but you can see we're continually making progress to get towards that. With Oak Ridge, we look at material type problems using a variation of this algorithm that allows us to run many quantum circuits and create a way of getting confidence that we're converging and getting towards to look at these uh, lattice problems. And then at BASQ, they're looking at interesting dynamics and times in these condensed matter problems and starting to simulate the real-time dynamics of interesting lattice type examples. Optimization. Optimization, I think it's also interesting. We're seeing now we can start to get together as a community and start to formulate what are a set of benchmarks that we can actually start to look at optimization. With the optimization working group, they've created a list of about 11 benchmarks where if we can actually solve them and compare them to the best classical methods, we can start to rigorously look at optimization. With Los Alamos, there's an interesting idea of exploring multi-objective optimization. So not just one optimization with a constraint, how do you actually optimize and do trade between different types of variables? And the results suggest, uh, approx they show that there's an interesting uh, 
uh, space where Quantum, through uh, running on hardware as well as doing uh, uh, Monte Carlo, uh, uh, matrix product state simulation, are actually starting to show an interesting uh, gap compared to the classical methods. And then our startup partner Kapoor has looked at an interesting problem of mixing classical and quantum together and using quantum to either run a classical algorithm after or a quantum a classical to as an input into a quantum and looking at how they can do variations on different types of optimization problems and getting results that are interesting when you compare it to leading uh, classical methods such as CPLEX. Uh, one of my favorites, machine learning. When we approached machine learning early on, we decided to look at it in a way where we look through the lens of structure and data. We, call, we came up with this thing we call quantum, uh, covariant quantum kernels. And we looked at group structure and showed under certain, certain simple cases we could prove there would be a separation and then interesting types of groups we could look at and, and see how quantum performed. E.ON has extended this idea and actually made covariant quantum kernels at a large scale and of 156 and looked at interesting problems that get into the uh, case of classifying vehicles and things like that. And one of our startup partners, Cognitive, is actually approaching quantum machine learning in another interesting way. Uh, look forward to seeing the publication come out, but what they are doing is they are using the Hamiltonian to encode the data rather than the circuit, and then it becomes a energy minimization and allows you to put large data into the problem and actually look at a solution when you're not restricted to how fast I can put data into the classical computer. From differential equations, one of my favorite. Our team has recently looked at and shown that we can start to see a BQB, so an exponential speed up for stochastic differential equations. The first end-to-end -end algorithm for simulating noisy dynamics of nonlinear systems, you can find the archive preprint here, this matters because if we can keep extending these ideas, areas such as Navier-Stokes, as well as other examples of differential equations become possible. Then with MIT, uh, we're looking at interesting dynamics in nonlinear, again nonlinear, at um, fusion-like problems, and we are able to uh, do algorithms that could be interesting for the future plasma dynamics. And then one of the startup partners, Calib, eh, has an interesting way of rather than solving the differential equation, they look at correlation, uh, they map it to a certain set of polynomials and then turn it into a loss function that they can minimize and look at nonlinear differential equations, showing that these type of spaces are opening up. So if you look through this, you start to see these horizontals emerge. The four they said, Hamiltonian simulation, optimization, quantum machine learning, and then partial differential equations. And now you can start to ask, can we start to see use cases forming? I'm not gonna go through all of these, but you can see they go across health and life science to energy, to finance, to even simulating, um, simulating events, numerical methods. And as we explore and develop this set of horizontals, I expect to see more of these uh, use cases come out. Just to finish up, so I said, we're at this point of algorithm discovery. At IBM, as I said at the start, we're committed to many different strategic partners. I don't have time to go through all of them, but I wanted to give you a flavor of how are we making sure that we can get the algorithms happening at the universities. One of our most uh, strategic partners is, the, is in Japan, where we've worked with the University of uh, Tokyo, as well as with the University of Chicago as a 10-year partnership for advancing algorithms. We've committed with uh, universities in Korea, Japan and Chicago to train students. And we're already seeing that we're seeing more and more students coming out of both uh, Kyo University and Tokyo University. And then with Riken, we are starting, as I talked about that application of using a quantum computer injected into a classical computer to explore quantum and classical computers working together where they've just installed one of our latest systems right next to Fugaku. Basque in the Spain region, they have traditionally a very strong team in condensed matter and material science. They've done a lot of interesting uh, theoretical physics and we're working on joint research where we can really push the limits of condensed matter or materials and understand where quantum will matter in that. And, as, and we're working on uh, basically inst uh, installing this as a, a snapshot of the current system that is getting set up there at this point in time. With Chicago, we've um, committed, we've had a long history with Chicago, and at Chicago, the same idea. We need more algorithms, universities, 
uh, uh, industries coming together, and the creation of the non National Quantum Algorithm Center with the IQP that involved the University of Chicago and the U UIUC, uh, dedicated to how can we get these algorithms to matter for industry type problems. We've worked on different ways where we can, with the University of Chicago, even start to seed startups so that we can imagine creating this movement from, um, from algorithm discovery to software startups and really get this industry going. And then we've had a 10 year partnership with the UIUC on dedicated to quantum computing, AI and hybrid cloud on understanding different types of algorithms. Then finally, with RPI in New York, we are working on jointly how we really make this future of classical and quantum coming together where we're doing joint research on understanding how we can develop this architecture. How can we actually get a quantum computer and a classical computer working together without reinventing the wheel? And with RPI and many of our other partners around the world, we've shown already that we can inject quantum software into the HPC stack with a recent Sloan uh, publication. So I wanted to just conclude and say, I do believe we've got at the point where we can go from quantum devices to quantum computers. That is where we're at a point where we can think of them as a scientific tool. They can no longer be simulated by the brute force classical computer. We can explore the interactions between different approximate classical methods and quantum, but really we can start to set ourselves up for discovering algorithms, which is the only thing we need to do to really get us to the point that I believe we can reach with the full potential, and that's to get algorithms discovery. I wanna thank you for the time, and I hope you enjoyed my presentation.